In this lecture, we're actually going to start determining the magnitudes of the internal member forces generated within our structure in response to the external loads applied to the structure. The best way to do this is to jump straight into an example. The first method we'll consider is called the joint resolution method. Consider this simple pin jointed structure, subject to the horizontal 10 kN load at joint C. The first step when analysing any pin jointed structure is to determine the reaction forces. Remember, our structure is in a state of static equilibrium, so no matter what the internal forces are, the reactions must be such that the equilibrium of the whole structure is maintained. So using the techniques you've learned so far, construct the three equilibrium equations to identify the three unknown reactions. Remember, using the equations of equilibrium, we can only determine a maximum of three unknown reactions. We can see that HA is 10 kN acting to the left. It resists the applied 10 kN external force. The two vertical reactions are the only vertical forces to consider. Finally, taking moments about point A yields VD equal to 10 kN. We can now use this information to determine that VA equals 10 kN acting downwards. It's a good idea at this point to redraw the reaction forces acting in the correct direction. In the joint resolution method, we consider each joint within our structure in isolation. To do this, we start off by making an imaginary cut through all of the members that connect into the joint of interest. Now, when making this cut through these members, what we're doing is essentially revealing the internal member forces inside each member we cut through. We then take that joint after we've cut the members that connect into it, and we consider equilibrium of the joint in isolation from the rest of the structure. Now, the important thing to note here is, for each joint, we only have two equations of equilibrium that we can use. The sum of the forces in the x or horizontal direction and the sum of the forces in the y or vertical direction. A moment equilibrium equation is no help to us here because all of the forces that we're considering when we're looking at this joint all pass through the joint and so they're all concurrent. And basically, if there are no lever arms to consider, then there's no moments to consider. Now, taking a look at our structure, think which joints we could start with and which joints we couldn't. Well, we can't start with joints B or D because there are three members entering those joints and therefore three unknowns. Remember, we can only solve each joint for two unknowns or a maximum of two unknowns. We could start with joints A or C because there's only two members entering joints A or C and therefore two unknowns. So our two equilibrium equations, our force equilibrium equations, will be sufficient to solve for those unknowns at those joints. So, isolating joint C first, cutting through the horizontal member reveals its internal force. We'll call this horizontal member CB as it runs from node C to B. We're calling this unknown internal member force TCB and assuming it's a tension force. Remember, internal member forces pointing away from the joint are tension forces, while those pointing towards the joint are compression forces. Now, if our equations give us a negative number, as always, we'll know our initial assumption was incorrect and the internal force is actually a compression force. Similarly, we can label the internal member force TCD revealed by cutting through member CD, again noting our assumption that it's a tensile force. Now we know our structure is in a state of static equilibrium and therefore so too is the joint. So the sum of vertical and horizontal forces acting on the joint must be zero. So constructing our equilibrium equations in the usual way yields TCB equal to 10 kN tension, as we assumed, and TCD equals zero. There are no vertical forces acting on the joint, which means TCD must be zero for all vertical forces to be balanced. At this point, it's a good idea to draw the member forces directly on the structure, so we can keep track of how the solution is progressing. Note that because I know the force of member CB is 10 kN tension, I can also draw the corresponding arrow at joint B indicating tension. The fact that member CD has no internal force is represented here by a circle or zero. Now we can proceed to joint B as we've reduced the number of unknowns at that joint to two. The procedure is exactly the same. By cutting through the members, we've revealed the internal member forces. Any that we don't yet know, we assume to be tension until proven otherwise. With two unknowns, we can use our two force equilibrium equations to solve the joint. This gives us TBD equal to 10 root 2 kN in compression and TBA equal to 10 kN in tension. 
Again, represent this information by drawing directly onto the structure. The last member force that needs to be identified is TAD. To do this, we could isolate either joint A or D. So we'll go for joint A. Notice that we can already see that the vertical force equilibrium has been established. And we can see by inspection that to maintain horizontal force equilibrium, TAD must equal 10 kN tension. And with that, we've solved for all internal member forces within our structure. In identifying these forces, we've identified how the 10 kN external force is transmitted through the truss frame and down to the supports. So, to summarise, the first step is to calculate the reaction forces using our three equations of equilibrium. Next, we identify a joint that has a maximum of only two unknowns. You can think of this as our entry point into the problem. We then isolate that joint, cutting the members entering the joint to reveal their internal member forces. At this point, we can use our two force equilibrium equations to determine the unknown member forces. Then we simply move joint by joint through the structure, in each case tackling joints with only one or two unknowns. It's important to take a step back when you finish the solution and look to see if it makes sense to you. For example, our solution tells us that the diagonal member BD is in compression, so it's being compressed or squeezed under the influence or action of the externally applied load. This makes sense when we think what would happen to the structure if we removed BD. The structure would deform into a parallelogram shape and collapse as a mechanism with joints B and D moving towards each other. So member BD is the only thing stopping nodes B and D moving towards and meeting each other. Therefore, it should make sense to us that member BD is in a state of compression trying to stop this from happening. If we removed member BD and replaced it with a diagonal between nodes A and C, this member would be in tension trying to stop nodes A and C moving away from each other under the action of the externally applied load. This type of visualisation is a good exercise to do at the end of each solution. Try and find the logical reasons why the forces are the way they are. We'll work through this next example to help clear up any confusion you might still have, but first try and work through the problem by yourself. The first thing we notice about this structure is that it's symmetrical and the loading is symmetrical. This allows us to focus on only half of the structure, knowing the distribution of internal forces in the other half will be the same. Be careful though, if the structure was not symmetrical or the loading was uneven, we couldn't use this shortcut. As always, the first task is to work out the support reactions using the three equations of equilibrium. Rather than constructing the equations, simply by inspecting the structure and loading, we can see that there are no external horizontal forces applied, and therefore HA must equal zero. By similar inspection, we can see that a total of 30 kN has been applied acting downwards. We know this must be balanced by the two support reactions. As we've already said, it must be balanced equally. And so we can conclude that VA and VB both equal 15 kN. Now we can identify our first joint to isolate. It turns out that the only joint we can start with is A or E, as these are the only joints with two unknowns. So isolating joint A, we cut through the incoming members and reveal the internal member forces, which we assume to be tension until proven otherwise. Applying our two force equilibrium equations yields TAB equal to 15 root 2 kN in compression and TAH equal to 15 kN in tension. Again, make sure to represent this information on the structure. Remember, due to symmetry, the member forces on the opposite side of the structure will be the same. The next joint we can tackle is H, as it has only two unknown member forces. Isolating H, we can see simply by inspection that THG equals 15 kN tension and THB equals 10 kN tension. In this case, the unknowns are obvious and there is no need to go through the process of writing out the equilibrium equations. Now we can isolate joint B. Equating the sum of the vertical forces equal to zero yields TBG equal to five root two kN. Evaluating the horizontal force equilibrium equation yields TBC equal to 20 kN compression. Now the only remaining joint that has not yet been investigated is joint C, with the unknown member force TCG. By simple inspection we can see that the horizontal force is balanced. We can also see that TCG must equal zero as there are no other forces acting on the joint. Therefore, the externally applied loads do not induce any internal force in member CG. 
Now you should have a good understanding of how to use the joint resolution method to determine the internal member forces within your truss structures. Now, as with any technique in structural analysis, the key to mastering it is practice. There's no shortcuts. You just have to do a lot of questions and practice, practice, practice. Now, as a starting point, try tackling the last question with this unsymmetrical load arrangement. Now, remember, you're not going to be able to rely on symmetry now, so you're going to have to work through more joints within the structure to solve the problem. You can download the work solution to this question in the supplementary material for this lecture. Also make sure you work through the examples at the end of this section. Now in the next lecture we're going to discuss another method for determining the internal member forces within a structure and this method is called the method of sections. This has one particular advantage over the joint resolution method which we've just discussed and we'll dig into that now in the next lecture.